course, be careful saying rain down right now. Started raining so hard in the service at the other campus, they could barely hear me almost. They had a metal roof there. And of course, a metal roof and rain puts me to sleep. So they had to wake me up twice in the sermon. So, no. You know it's boring then, don't you? It's good to see you today. Happy July 4th is coming up. Continue to pray for our country, our nation, those of our young men and women who are out serving our country around the world today, and pray for revival. That's the greatest need in our nation right now is that God do something supernatural in our midst and in our hearts and our lives. Amen? amen? Oh, you can amen much louder than that. That means you need revival, all right? <laughs> you need to wake up to the hour that we're living in. It's a, 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 it's a, a time we can see God do some marvelous and some amazing things if the church will rise to the occasion. I want to talk to you today about kind of where I think, where I've been, all right? Before I get into that, let me remind you of our preteen camp coming up July 8th to 11th. Now, I normally don't make a lot of these announcements, but this really is an important. Several of the most important things we do in our church are the, our camps and our retreats because they are times to get away and get, it, get a word from God, even for our youngest of kids, those starting in first grade up to that age group. So if you haven't signed your kid up for preteen camp, it leaves next Sunday after the services. It's not too late, but you need to take care of it today. Uh, we try to minimize the cost as much as possible. If you need help with that in some regard, let us know. Uh, uh, we never turn anybody away from any of our retreats or in our camps over financial issues. So just let us know. Get a hold of Gary or Juarez or Sophie or anybody in the children's ministry or Stacy. Uh, application forms are out, back there. It's not really an application. It's just basic information we need if your child is going. So be sure and get that all filled out. Get signed up today. It's, it's, it's something that, one, you get a little break. You can send your kids off and let Gary deal with them. Amen. Two is that uh, it'll be a challenging time in life. We always have kids come to know Christ. I think we really need to focus in on our, our ministries that deal with our children as much as youth and everything else because, well, I remember when I first started preaching, it was Billy Graham who said, you know, the majority of the people who came to his crusades and revivals and, and made salvation decisions were people from the ages of, you know, they were teenage years up to 19. He said, you know, in fact, his point was, if we don't reach them by that age, we probably won't reach them. Of course, Christian uh, leaders today say that if we don't reach them by the time they're 12, we probably won't reach them. And that's so true because of the culture that we're living in that is so anti-Christ. And I mean, not just, you know, uh, in, in regard to... Uh, mindset of people today, just not being concerned about the things of God or the Lord Jesus. I, I mean, the, the culture is anti-Christ. The world we live in is so uh, in opposition to Christianity. It's amazing how the world constantly talks about tolerance, 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 and they'll be tolerant with everybody but evangelicals and born-again believers. So uh, it's important we get our kids under the sound of the gospel at very early ages and every opportunity we have or the vacation Bible school or Bible studies or Awana's programs, everything we do is, is, is geared toward getting the Word of God into these children to prepare them for the things that are ahead of them. So get your kids in camp. You'll be glad you did one day. Amen? Better than getting them out of jail. Amen. Now, back to what I was saying at one point there. What I want to share with you today is, 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 is a lot in lines of personal testimony as well as it is in lines of sharing the Word of God with you because uh, uh, Kathy and I and our family, we've been experiencing a lot of different things here lately and so many different fronts, and I wouldn't really have time to share a lot of that with you today. I will try to share a little few highlights uh, with you of some things that we've been going through. But there are times, and maybe you've had one of these recently or you've been through one in the past here, well, you go through difficulties, and it's not just one thing that pops up. It's like one thing after another, after another, after another. You, ever, you have those seasons, and it's like it's just a, a season of difficulty and crisis that you go through. And I want to talk to you. I want to address that to you today because that's where I am right now in regard to my own personal, what God's working in me and what he's saying to me. And I've always discovered after doing this for the hundred years I've been doing it, that what ministers to folks mostly is you just kind of share where, what God's doing, where God's at in, in, in context of your own life, your own church, your own ministry, because everybody's there. I mean, we're all going through different issues, and we're all facing different things, and uh, I think it's Bill Stafford said that, you know, the, in the storm or out of a storm or headed for a storm. And so that's where most of us are today. We're either in one or just out of one, or, or, or there's one on the horizon somewhere. And part of that's obviously true because we live in a world that, you know, the Bible tells us the God of this world is the devil. That's a liturgy, by the way. That, you know, that we're living in a, in, a, in a world that has been 
uh, has become malignant because of rebellion against God and sin against God. So you have to deal with that kind of trouble as well as all the other kinds of troubles. And then add to that, you know, the, the fact that if you're a child of God, if you are a believer, Jesus said in this world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So he said, you're going to have trouble. It's by virtue of the fact that you belong to me, if they hated me, they're going to hate you, so get ready for it. And then there's that kind of trouble that I probably won't even begin to deal with today. That kind of trouble we get ourselves into as Christians when we know we're disobeying God and we're disobedient. The Bible says God a, is, a, is a good father. He's our heavenly father and he will chasten us. So there's the kind of trouble you get into, you just invite it, all right? But I'm not talking about that kind of trouble as much as I am just talking about trouble in the context of, as a child of God that you face in your particular life. In fact, I want to call this message this Sunday and next Sunday, the day of trouble. Open your Bible with me to Psalms chapter 20, and we're going to look at that today about the day of trouble. And like I say, sometimes it seems more than a day, it's a week, it's a month. In fact, I feel I've been kind of going through a day of trouble since January 1st. So maybe, maybe you're in the same boat as well, where you're saying like, it's been one thing after another that seems to kind of add up. In, in, in chapter 20 of Psalms, it really is a declaration, a plea, a prayer that has to do uh, with victory. And the trouble that they're facing in this regard is that the enemies of God have raised up their head and they're seeking to destroy the people of God, as you see over and over through Scripture. We face those same kind of dilemmas. Some of the things we face are really spiritual crises and they're really spiritual battles in our life that God wants to lead us to so we can experience his victory. Again, some are just things that God has doing a deeper work in our heart and life. So we're going to try to distinguish some of that this morning and get into mostly talking about how God wants to use all trouble, any kind of trouble, to, to get us to a deeper walk and a deeper place with him in our own heart and life. In Psalms chapter 20, uh, it, we're going to read about four or five of these, and we'll look at this through the, through the rest of the verses in, as we go through it. But it says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. And may he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. And may he remember. Now it goes on to talk about some other things, but I want to underline a couple of words here to start with. First of all, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Obviously, the context of what I'm talking about here is that as a believer, that we go into this world around us day by day, and there are times when trouble comes, it raises up its ugly head. It seems greater at other times and sometimes than other times, but nonetheless, we're there and we're facing this. The whole idea is here of a believer who's going to obviously turn to God in, in this regard, because that's, that's the first step for all of us. And even if you're not a Christian, uh, I discovered after I became a Christian that the things that were happening in my life prior, I call it my B.C. days before Christ, in those B.C. days, God was allowing a lot of things to come into my life to get me to that place where I would seek Him, where I would reach out to Him, where I would trust Him. So may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. And that's where we turn to. That's our ultimate goal and everything that we're going through. May he set you securely on high. Not only is he going to answer, he's going to do something is the idea here of establishing us, setting us securely, which is what we all need. And may he send you help. You're not in this alone. You're not going through this alone. God never experienced, never uh, expected nor does he desire for you to experience your calamities of life on your own by yourself whatever you're dealing with you have to realize that he wants to send you help and I love the way because it's from his sanctuary and the sanctuary in the context of the Old Testament here we know it talks about the tabernacle the temple but the whole idea is the tabernacle the temple that's where you meet God all right May God send you help from where he is and where you can meet him from. And it says, you know, may he support you from Zion. And then may he remember your offerings, your meal offerings, your burnt offerings. And the, the context of that for us in this age is may he remember our offerings and may they be acceptable in his sight. What makes our offerings acceptable in his sight? Romans 12, we present our body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. This is your reasonable service and worship. So the idea is that we're, we're turning to God, we're going to lean on God, we're going to look to God, and we're going to see what God will do and can do in the context of whatever we're going through, because we definitely need Him to remember us at this time. You know, I, I have had times when I've gone to the Lord and I've experienced difficulty in my life where I, I was what, asking and was thinking, is He cognizant of what I'm going through? And if, he's, if He is, can He remember that I'm here dealing with these kind of things now? Now, I'm sure you're probably a little more spiritual than I am in that regard. 
You've never questioned the Lord. You've never, you know, wondered about why there seems to be no activity, why the heavens had seemed to turn to brass. But I think all of us, if we'll be genuinely honest and real about this, there's times we've gone through stuff and we've said, God, where are you in this? Why are you not answering? Why am I not hearing this? Why, is it, why does it seem you seem so far away at this point in, 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 in the context of what I'm experiencing in this moment? I want to share this morning in, in, in relationship to this passage some personal experience. But I, I did so with hesitation as I began to prepare this message because there's nothing worse, nothing that I hate more than a preacher who gets up and it's all about him and all about poor me and all about little pity party because I've discovered when I have those kind of parties, nobody shows up anyway. So <laughs> send out all the invitations, but if it's all about you, you can forget it. But I... I do realize that God allows us to experience things in our life not only for our benefit, but for the benefit of other people. And many of you already know some of the dilemmas that Kathy and I and our families walked through just in the, this group right here as far as our church is concerned. But there's been a lot of other things that have, have come up on the horizon outside even what you're familiar with. I don't want to get into everything today because I don't want it to sound like that because, you know, it's really all about I want to share with you what God has done. So I kind of have to kind of spread a, a black kind of tablecloth out so you can see how bright the diamonds are when I put them out before you. Just to see the glory and the majesty of God and how he answers. It's, it's been, as I said, even from January 1st, a, a unique year for me in, in regard to uh, my walk with God, in regard to uh, things that are going on in our own family, and our own lives. Uh, issues of the church, pastoring the, the, the two different uh, congregations that we have, and the fellowships we have. So it's been just, it seems from January 1 that it's, it's been a little uh, crazy about our household and about my life in so many different ways. But at the same time, it's been something where God's really done some unique things in my heart and my life. So I, I want to lay some of that out before you. Let me get more specific and maybe a little more current with you. Uh, but, and, and review you some things that we have experienced personally on a, on a level in our own particular family uh, at the Joe Arms household. Uh, many of you know that we left for the pastor's conference back in April 19th. I told you when we went to Belize this last time in early June that I was going to go back to Belize and turn off whatever got turned on because it seemed like it just became a flood at that particular point in time. I was looking forward at that point in time having the pastor's conference and taking some time off because it has been a very stressful year. And it's been a very, I mean, it's like every day was just the mountains of just things that we were dealing with, and the, even this pastor and personal life and those kind of things. Just a lot going on. Uh, most of my staff had already taken the first of their vacations for the year, and so I was finally looking forward to getting some of that done myself because it had just been crazy. So uh, right before we left, many of you know that Kathy went to the doctor and was diagnosed with a bronchitis problem. And uh, so we left for Belize because she was feeling you know, a little better, she said, so she wanted to go and participate in the pastor's conference. She's developed a lot of friendships with the pastor's wives, and she wanted to meet with them and encourage them as well. So we jumped on a plane and headed down to Belize and got down there and started the conference. And by the way, as I shared when I came back, probably the most successful pastor's conference we've done in Central America. And more in attendance of pastors and the wives than we've ever had. The participation was phenomenal. The ministry was phenomenal. It was just a glorious time in the Lord. About the second day of that conference, though, we received word from my mother that my stepdad, L.R. Gentry, a lot of you that are longtime members around here, you know him and is a man of God who loves God and been a tremendous blessing in my life and is a tremendous source of counsel for me and as, a, as a pastor and an, an elder pastor speaking to me and giving me some insight and instruction through the years. But uh, we see word he was sick. He was not doing well. He's 86 at this time. Uh, had already experienced through his life lots of complications with diabetes and open heart surgery and stuff. You know, I, 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 I figured he'd never make it past 60, all the problems he had that were going on. But God had blessed him with a long, full life. But things were deteriorating. So by the time we get to the end of the pastor's conference, it's, we get a call that things are looking very bad. They're calling the family in. Please come as soon as possible. When the conference was over, we had to wait a day. But the day after that conference, we were able to get a ticket on a plane, come back home, cancel the vacation, Change the air flights, you know how it is, and you, a lot of times you're thinking about, there goes that money, and there it went, because you pay for all that in advance. But anyway, we praised the Lord, we got on a plane, got back into Houston about 5 o'clock in the evening, hopped 
in the car, drove back out to Magnolia from the airport, dumped all our clothes out, loaded up some clean stuff, and headed for San Angelo. We, me and the family was already there, and we got there about one o'clock in the morning and checked in a hotel. Early in the morning, got to the hospital as soon as I could, and uh, he'd come out of uh, some things that they were trying to do with dialysis, and it just made the problem worse, and things were deteriorating very, very quickly. The whole time, my wife's still not feeling well. She's saying, I don't know what's going on. When I get back into to Houston, I'm going to get another x-ray on my lungs because this thing is bronchitis. I can't breathe. I don't know what's going on. I have no energy. It's just the real problems are, are, seem to be escalating at that point. So while she's there, we're dealing with that. At the same time, I uh, get to the hospital and talking to the doctors. And out in the hallway, one of the doctors, I said, well, what is the prognosis here? He said, well, you know, uh, he doesn't have long. He may have up to three days to three weeks at the very best, probably a week no longer than that, but I don't give him more than about three days. I said, well, can we take him home rather, rather than be here in the hospital? Of course, me and hospitals aren't best of friends anyway. I, you know, I, I visit them. I visit people in the hospitals. I don't plan. I have no desires to stay in hospitals. Some of you that work in hospitals know exactly what I mean. And some hospitals are different than other hospitals, especially the hospitals in Podunk, Texas are a lot, nothing against those folks out there, it's just, you know, I figure if we don't get him out of here in three, less than three days, they're probably going to kill him anyway. That's kind of the way I was viewing this whole particular thing, along with many of the families. So the Lord let us take him home. Hospice was brought in, they brought in the hospital beds and the equipment, and they gave us all the stuff, you know, for the last moments of his life, all the painkillers, put them in the refrigerator and marked everything for us. And, uh, kind of gave us an overview of what our expectations could be, and we'd already heard what the doctor's expectations were going to be. And when we left the hospital, those who were there, he was not doing well. I mean, some of the medications he'd gone, the experience he'd gone on, he was hallucinating things. He didn't realize he was even at the hospital. He thought he was at his house fixing the roof on something, you know. And, I mean, he literally thought he was there patching stuff up in his sleep. And uh, so we had some, some unique encounters in dealing with him in that regard. But we got him home. Some of those other medications began to get out of his system, and he began to get clear. Uh, we began to have fellowship. He'd be set up in bed. He wanted to walk to the bathroom. I had to convince him, you still can't walk. He, we had a little conflict over that, he and I did. And he realized about halfway to the restroom he couldn't walk, and we went back to the bed. And we learned a lot in those three or four days about how to change bladder bags and set him on the potty and had a potty in the living room, and I got to sit with him on the potty, and we had some unique fellowship together in the last days of his life. I remember sitting there beside him. I'm sitting on a little footstool while he's sitting on the toilet beside his bed. And I said, I know this is going to be difficult for you. I said, you and I have had a lot of experience. He says, yeah. I says, this is the first, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, we laughed and chuckled, but you know, I uh, remember Jesus' words to Peter. He said, when you get old, they're going to take you places you don't want to go because you won't be able to get anywhere yourself. And, that's exactly what we walked through in our life. But praise the Lord, God gave him some cognizance in those days and friends and family and people gathering around and singing together and praising the Lord and sitting down one afternoon, I remember just Charity asking him questions about, you know, the depression years and moving out, his call to preach and just reminiscing on all of those things. It was, it was time of hardness and difficulty for the family, but it certainly was a time of God's great grace and how God gives grace to believers even in those, diff in those difficult days. Well, three days went by. In fact, I sat by his bed on the third day and said, you're supposed to die today. <laughs> Y'all know how comforting I am around hospital beds, don't you? <laughs> he understands my humor, praise the Lord. He just kind of chuckled and said, yeah, I guess that's going to happen, is it? In fact, it was a couple of months before that actually did happen. In fact, he got to doing better and I told him, well, we've got to go back to Houston and, and take care of some issues and stuff. And other family members were coming and going and helping and staying. And so Kathy and I, we headed back uh, to Houston, I guess, when, like I said, we left on April tw around the t 12th is when she received her prognosis about bronchitis. We left around the 17th or 18th. And uh, we headed home, uh, you know, back somewhere, I, I guess, around May 1st, you know. Uh, so she went in and had this chest x-ray done, and she said, well, I'm going to go to the doctor in a couple of days. Let me read. And I said, no, you're going to go to the doctor, you know, today, and that was on a Wednesday. And I would planned to preach that particular Wednesday night. And uh, they called me from the doctor's office, said, you come get your wife and take the emergency room immediately. It's not anything to do with bronchitis or lungs. It's a misdiagnosis. 
Her heart is in affibulation. It's beating around 450 times in the upper region of the heart. It's beating about 100 times in the lower region of the heart, and she needs to get immediately to an emergency room. Well, it was 4 o'clock Wednesday afternoon, and I was not under the law. <laughs> I drove under Grace to the hospital. It was a miracle I didn't get it, I mean, to the, to the doctor's office. Picked Kathy up and took her immediately to St. Luke's. They came in and began to run tests and ultrasounds and all the other stuff that they do and blood tests and everything and watched her overnight and all the misery and pain she was in. They came the next morning. The doctor took me aside and said, we got two major problems here. One, your wife's probably going to have to have open heart surgery. She has a very, very, very sick heart. I mean, that was his terminology. A very, very, very sick heart. And uh, one of the valves in her heart's not working. It's just washing blood back into the upper regions of her heart. The afibulation that's going on is just churning it like butter, so we're afraid of a blood clot on top of everything else. We're putting on a lot of blood thinners. Same time, we believe she has, a, uh, she has an inflamed... Uh, somebody help me here. Thank you very much. Gallbladder. <laughs> Some of you have been through the process with me. And it needs to come out. We'll probably do that the same time we do the surgery on the, on the heart. So, but we can't, we can't do what she needs to have done here. We want to transfer her to St. Luke's downtown, so we get in the ambulance. We move downtown. They began to do more tests, and of course, that's when many of you found out what was going on. You began to pray, and we began to just storm the gates of heaven. Uh, we had people all over the world, pastors in Central America, pastors in Eastern Europe that we ministered to. I had formed them. We put it out through our prayer line, which has hundreds, if not thousands, of people on our prayer line. And praise God, I believe it was, it was, it was those petitions to heaven that we began to see one significant event after another unfold. We, the gallbladder thing just disappeared. We went back the next day. They said, we need to do a nuclear test. We're not sure. They went in, did the dye, the nuclear test thing, came back. Well, there's nothing wrong with the gallbladder. But yet, this, the, uh, all the ultrasounds and x-rays before showed it is in bad shape. And they said, and the uh, valve in the heart, well, it's not as bad as, as we saw on that. It's, in fact, it looks like we did the ultrasounds again. The valve is it's leaking. It's, it's leaking badly, but not that bad, and uh, may just need to repair the valve. And we'll have to do open heart surgery to do that, though. And then, of course, the afibulation was still going. Three days of this in the hospital, test after test, that we went through. Every day she's going through tests. And as we were going through this process, it was, it, the amazing thing was to watch what God was doing in her life. It's like she wasn't even cognizant. Yes, she was purting. She was going through all this. But she was so busy talking to people about Jesus and just ministering to technicians and nurses and people. And, and it, you know, I, I felt like the genuine backslider of all of us. You know, I'm over here wringing my hands. Oh, God, where are you? Where are you? you know, she, she, she's just walking in, in grace and, and, and glory. But in the context of all that, it was it, what God did in the miraculous sense, it was that each day it was a different report. It was a different report on the heart valves. Each day it was, from, it was leaking, then it's moderately leaking, now it's slightly leaking. The day they finally get the heart back into rhythm, they tried once before going internally and looking at her heart and shocking it from the inside. That worked for about a minute or two, then it kicked back into the crazy things that it was doing with the affibulation. Went back in the next day, and they hopefully get the heart back in rhythm through medications, uh, they said, if it doesn't happen by day three, then we're going to go in and we're going to do what's called a cardioversion. We're going to put a metal plate here and one back here, and we're going to shock the heart back into a rhythm uh, and hope that that works. Well, they came in. They said, we're going to put you to sleep. Came in with anesthesia and all the other stuff, and I'm sitting there by the bed saying, I really don't want to watch this. And praying along with so many of you that were praying for her, and the Lord, I mean, all of a sudden, the monitors pipe up, and everything's going back great. She's doing good. The heart goes automatically back into rhythm without the cardio version, without the shocks and everything else. So it was another just, you know, everybody's kind of in awe when the doctor says, you know, she's, she's different. <laughs> I said, I've been trying to tell people that for years in a good way, all right? She's different. I said, you know, I said, there's another Dr. Rome in the halls up here. And he said, well, there must be. I said, his name is Jehovah Rofi. He is, he is the great God of grace and healing. But anyway, they went on wanted to go ahead and do this thing where they go in through, and those of you who've had stents and those kind of things know how they go in through the groin and they take the probes up there. They wanted to do what was called an ablation because the nerves were still firing all over the heart where they're not supposed to be. So they, they basically send a heat probe in and just burn certain circles and areas around where they don't want those nerve endings sending signals. And they said it takes about three to six months for that to heal. But while they were in there, they did the ablation. They came back and said, I want to check more than anything else that particular valve because that's been confusing to us all along. It was just doing that and looking busted and blown out and, you know, had to be repaired to all the way now. It's just slightly leaking. He said, so I checked it. And he says, you know, there's, he said, there's no more leaking than what the average person has. He said, it's, there's nothing wrong with the heart valve. So there's nothing wrong with the heart valve. There's nothing wrong with the, all these things that were going to acquire more radical type procedures. God, God just showed up in mercy and grace. 
you know, it was, it's a phenomenal thing. So we went through that and got through those particular things and uh, got home on our 37th wedding anniversary. The Lord let us go back to the house and uh, celebrate our anniversary by getting out of the hospital. So praise the Lord for, for what he did in that. Meanwhile, we went back for another checkup. They told us, that, well, the heart's out of rhythm again. So we come back to the hospital tomorrow. We're going to do the shock. So we go back tomorrow to do the shock treatment, and we get in there, and they're preparing her. As before, they bring the anesthesia in. They bring, start putting the little pads on her front and back and where they're going to do the shock treatment, hooking up all the computers. And they had like four monitors in there. And before the person comes in to do the procedure, one of the nurses says, somebody needs to look at these monitors, by the way. There's nothing wrong with her heart. There's nothing going on here. And so they called for the main floor nurse, and the main floor nurse said, well, it looks good to me. And so they called the head nurse. And the head nurse comes in and says, well, let's call the doctor in. And then they brought in somebody else and said, we need to do a 12-point EKG, whatever that is. And you know, they put more probes on you. And so they did all that said, there's nothing wrong with you. Please go home. You know, I've discovered you never pay the hospital anything up front. <laughs> I still hadn't got my money back from that deal. Just praying that they do, you know, they don't have any problem taking your money. Just getting it back seems to be a problem with it. I don't think they really practice that very much. I have a procedure for refunding money. But they did send us home. We had a praise the Lord report, and she's been doing great, and she's on the medications, and they're breaking off some of those, and hopefully in a couple of months when the ablation things are healed, they'll be able to take her off most all those medications. But it, it, it's been a, an interesting journey. A couple of days after that, we got word that my stepdad had passed away. Family went out again. We all... We're all there, and it, it was a pretty supernatural time. We had a this church probably held about 300 people in that little auditorium, and then we asked just family members, those who were present, because all of them didn't show. There's, and uh, I think that two thirds of that congregation stood up that were family members, because my, you know, my mom had six kids, and my stepdad had six kids, and then they had 30-something grandkids and 53 or 54 great-grandkids, and another great-great I think or two on the way. And so it was just a mass of people that showed up. And I had the, the privilege of uh, getting to oversee his homegoing celebration service. And we, we had a glorious celebration service. Still didn't take away from the fact that you hurt when you lose people. And you, it hurts. And all of us have experienced that in our lives on some level, in some way, in some places. But like I say, it was one thing that kind of pursued after another thing, after another thing. And uh, when we came home after that, and a few days later, still moving and going, I had to leave for the mission trip. In fact, it was Jimmy Cabrera who came up to him about the second night of the mission trip and said, Are you okay? <laughs> I said, I'm tired. <laughs> he said, well, you're 60. <laughs> like, I needed to hear that. <laughs> He's learned his encouraging skills from me. I hate to say it. <laughs> I said, I don't think it's been 60. I think it's the last 60 days that I'm just tired. And... Uh, Praise the Lord. He brought some men over and prayed for me. But the, the, those of you, you were here last Sunday, you heard what a phenomenal time that mission trip was and what God did in such glorious things and how God moved in supernatural ways. And it was a, a, a glorious time. And God did give grace. When we got home, I want you to know, I went home and I just passed out on the bed. I thought I was going to die. And uh, I, was, I was praising the Lord over the next couple of weeks as it's been a couple of weeks that we had so many men of God and people of God in ministry in our church that we had our Wednesday night services covered and Lenny and Don and Tim doing great jobs in, in, in that regard and preaching on Wednesday nights and covering those services because uh, I really don't think I had the physical strength, mental strength and emotional strength after these from you know, early April to present day July 1st to do much other than that. We did get two days off we took in this whole process of going to San Antonio and going to sleep. That was an exciting vacation for me. <laughs> but it was one that I needed. There's been a lot of things that have happened, I mean, that, that have gone in the context of this. We've lost some other family members and friends and relatives that have suffered difficulties and problems that have continued. We shipped our son off, out to, at, off to Afghanistan. That was just almost as difficult as hearing that my wife needed open-heart surgery. Your son's going to Afghanistan, so, which he's there today. But, you know, so there's, there's, we all deal with those things. I, I didn't want to make that sound like some kind of pity party. I want you to see that in the midst of it, there's such grace and such sustaining favor, and souls were being saved and lives were being changed, whether it's been in funerals or whether it's been in, in citywide crusades or pastor's conferences or in hospital rooms or in the community. And it's, it's been an interesting journey. 
But this is one passage from Psalms 20 that just kind of, kind of rose up out of all this. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. And may the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. And may he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. And may he remember all your meal offerings and find your offerings acceptable. Selah. Stop and think about that. That's what that means. Consider the grace of God. And so often, we forget the grace of God. We get so turned in. You've heard me use that terminology before. I, I think I stole it from Chuck Swindoll. It says, we get a severe case of ingronious ibolitis. You know, we start looking inwardly, and we get to think, well, nobody's going through this but me. And all we have to do is look around and see a lot of other people are experiencing the same kind of things that we experience. And sometimes we want to make our case unique and exceptional. Nobody knows. Nobody understands. Nobody has to deal with it. And people all around us are experiencing the same kind of things. The Bible says that we should be able to comfort others with the comfort that we've been comforted with. That we ought to be able to minister to others as we have allowed God to minister to us and to speak to us. But I did want to take this passage today and, and just kind of give you that kind of introduction to it. and Just cover two or three real quick points and we can pick up the, the heart of it next Sunday. But I, I really want you to catch this because as we deal with challenges and as we deal with troubles and as we deal with problems, we are never, ever alone unless we isolate ourselves. God is present. He is an ever-present help in time of need. He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. And you may be in a situation where no one does know what you're going through, and no one does seem to be what you're experiencing. Hey, but God does, and He's there, and He's not far away, and He is present, and may the Lord send you help in the day of trouble. That's the heartbeat of this. Now, first of all, as I talk about this, I just want to get into two or three points, and we'll close with that today. But num number one, and what we want to do is, why does trouble come? And what I want to deal with in this context is, is not some of the things that we would think of, and I mentioned it just briefly at the start of the message. Sometimes trouble comes because we're not right with God. Sometimes trouble comes because we don't know the Lord, and the Lord's trying to get us to a place of desperation in our life so we can hear His voice, so He can speak to us. And sometimes it's like we have to be peeled, not like a banana, it's just one layer, but like an onion, layer after layer after layer. And that's because God wants us to know Him. He wants us to experience His life. And it's the most merciful thing that God can do for you is to allow you to get in yourself into trouble so you'll call on Him, so you'll come to Him. Sometimes trouble comes because we're just not right with God as Christians. And that's that chastening hand of God. But the trouble I want to talk about today is a little different trouble. We find it over and over in the Scripture, this kind of trouble. It's that trouble that comes when, where first and foremost, God just wants to be glorified in your life. And I think that's what we miss so oftentimes. We look at a heart, well, I've seen, I thought I was right with God. I thought, but sometimes God just wants to convey glory to Himself through your lives. He wants to glorify Himself in your life. He wants to show Himself mighty on your behalf. And then He wants others to see that He is mighty in your life. He wants others to witness the power of God on your life. And so often, instead of slowing down long enough to hear from God, we seek to manipulate our way out of problems instead of hearing from God. We seek to resolve our own issues. I'll buy my way out of this. I'll, I'll you know, scheme my way out of this. I'll, I, I, I can get myself out of this. Instead of just saying, God, are you doing something in my life? Because more than anything else, this is the reason why we were all born to begin with, and especially why we are born again, is that we would bring God glory in our lives. Number one, you and I are here to glorify God with our lives. And if that's not what our life is about, then we're missing. We're, we're failing completely at this thing called life. God wants to be glorified in you and through you. Jesus said, the Father's been glorified in me. God, I pray for, my, for, my, for those, for my bride. And you see how he seeks in his prayer through John 17 to pray that God be glorified in our lives, that our hearts would be united, that we'd be right with God. And as a result, that God be so glorified that other people would see that and their lives would be changed. That's why the Bible says, you know, that you, you're like a city set on a hill. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify, glorify, glorify your Father who is in heaven. So what it says to us is that even when we're going through the experiences of life that everybody goes through, we don't approach it the same way. And we don't live it the same way because we're the people of God. And as we go through these things, we ought first and foremost to say, God, more than anything else in the midst of my situation, I want you to be glorified. Now sometimes that's hard to pray. That's hard to pray. When, it's, when it touches someone we love, isn't it? 
It's hard to pray when someone suffers beside us and we don't want them to suffer. And every one of us probably, if we care about people at all, and care about our children, care about our spouse, we would rather be the ones that hurt instead of them, wouldn't we? God, please let me trade places with them. I don't want them to suffer this. I don't want them to deal with this. But I want you to know, if they're going through it, God's giving them grace. Will they receive it? That's up to them. God is anointing them. Will they receive it? It's up to them. But ultimately, God wants to be glorified in them and those that are around them. God wants to be honored. And I can say honestly, as we've walked through these particular period of time in my life, uh, I, I probably honest with you, God probably got more glory through my wife than he did through her husband. But God was being glorified. And it's interesting, if you watch the process of your life, how often, and I, I'm just as guilty as, as, as any of you are, how often it takes a day or two or a month sometimes to realize, hey, excuse me, God, <laughs> hello, <laughs> I want you to be glorified. God, I, 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 I don't want to do this on my own. I can't do this on my own. I need you in my life. And as I, as I receive you in this situation, I do want you to be honored in my life. Can you say that about where you're at right now? What you're experiencing right now? What you're dealing with? And it may be something on your job. It may be something in your finances. It may be something going on in your own family. But can you stop long enough to say, God, honestly, I don't understand it, but I want you to be glorified. I don't know the reasons why. I've tried to get why and why I hadn't come. But even if why never comes, I still want you to be glorified in my life. I want you to be honored, and I want you to be praised more than anything else. My prayer is that people would see you in my life and through my life. The second thing is this, to certify the reality of the life and the power of God through our life. You say, what do you mean? That as we seek to give glory to God, that there are those around us who see the impact that the Holy Spirit is having in our life. They see us walking with integrity. They see us walking in peace. They see us walking in security. And those are things, peace, confidence, security, integrity, that the world doesn't understand a lot of. Jesus said there's no peace without him. He is the ultimate source of all peace. He's called the Prince of Peace. And to have peace in your life means that you're right with God. The God of all peace, it says, shall comfort you, shall sustain you, shall establish you. That's God's work and through His Spirit in our life is to bring peace. That even when our world is absolutely turned upside down and it may even be filled with sorrow and heartache and pain, there's still peace. It's confidence that God is on the throne. But it's not just for me as we said earlier, that God can comfort me with the, and I can comfort others with the comfort that He's given me. Well, I tell you, I saw that how obvious when you walk through these different venues, whether you're sitting talking to ambulance drivers or you're talking to doctors or nurses or technicians or sitting in a waiting room talking to other people that are sitting around you, how much you can see how many people don't know the peace that you have and how many people don't know the, the, the absolute security that you can experience with God in your life. They just don't know it. It's foreign to them. They don't understand it. They, they'll talk about prayer and even God, but God's kind of like third person out there somewhere who's not relative or relevant to their life. And they miss it. And what God's trying to do with you and the situation that you may well be in right now is to prove His existence and His power and His authority and His reality and His, and his grace through your life. So much so that not only do you experience it, you are like that city set on a hill. You are like that salt that brings that salty preservative to the rest of the world around you. That your life is not stuck under some bushel or under the bed somewhere, but it's shining for the glory of God. So God certifies His power and the reality of His power through your life. And the third and the last thing we'll discuss today is this, that we need to understand. These troubles come to compel us into the will of God for our life. I believe most of us struggle over this issue of knowing what the will of God is at different points and different times in our life. We want to know what God's will is in our life, but let me tell you something that may startle you. God wants you to know and to understand His will more than you want to know and understand His will. Let me say it again. I believe God wants you to know more than even you want to know. You say, but I really want to know. He wants you to know more than that. God doesn't play. He's not like some kind of, uh, uh, of, of uh, cruel heavenly technician who's messing stuff up in your life just to confuse you some more. And so let's, let's see what I can do to mess his mind up now. I believe God is sovereignly moving in our lives at all times if we're the children of God to order things in such a way that we discover his will and we discover his purposes for our life. 
But if we're all the time trying to run from things that God has for us, how are we ever going to get into the grace and to the flow and to the purposes of God for us? We're going to miss it completely. And so God literally, I believe, sovereignly allows situations in our life that compel us you know, to Him and move us towards Him so that we can discover Him and discover His grace and discover His will and purposes for our life. And you see this throughout the Scriptures. I mean, it's not just in the Old Testament. Or New Testament. It's all over the Word of God. I mean, you have, you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember, they are persecuted because they won't do what everybody else is doing. They won't bow down to the golden image, and so they're thrown into the fiery furnace. And the king is quite satisfied because he shows who's really in charge. Until he looks over into the fiery furnace, and there he sees Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he says, there's a fourth one like the Son of God. And they're walking around. They're not bound, as they were thrown into the fire bound, and they're not burned up. And he says, come forth and come hither. That means get out of there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what's he do? He begins to glorify God. He begins to glorify God. In fact, he passes out this little edict that says, if everybody else doesn't glorify God, we're going to turn your, your place, your house is going to become an outhouse. A dung heap. Okay, same thing. <laughs> it's going to be turned to a dung heap. So we're going to dump all the refuse if you don't glorify the God of Shadrach, Meshach. What's happening here? They're discovering the power of God in their life, but they're also being a witness to the power of God, and they're marching right through the most difficult of crisis they could ever face, right into the will of God for their life. And they're getting ready to be promoted, and God's going to be glorified in the context of it all. How often do we cut that short because we're just rejecting it? Another great illustration is that of Joseph. We know the story of Joseph. He's, he's, the, he's the favored son of the father, and the other brothers are all mad at him. They become jealous. They take him out to kill him. They end up just throwing him in a pit. Before it's all said and done, they end up selling him to a slave trader group. He ends up working as a slave and then being lied about and maligned about and thrown into prison, stays in prison for a long time, finally gets out of prison, ultimately elevated to the second place in the kingdom, the vice regent, second king, basically, in charge of things. And you remember the story. I, I don't know about you, but I, I, you think about this guy. I mean, how many of you are the younger brothers, younger sisters, all right? You always feel like they're always picking on you. I feel your pain. <laughs> but here he was, rejected by his own family. I mean, really rejected, not just kidding. Can you imagine? These are my brothers. These are the guys that are supposed to provide for me and protect me. I'm the, I'm the kid. I'm the littlest. I'm the youngest. They ought to be taking care of me. And now they're selling me as a slave. The day came when all his brothers bowed before him and he exposed himself as their brother. They didn't know at the time. And when they saw who it was, they were shocked and they were repentant and they were sorry because he was blessing them and receiving them. And he says, listen, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And you and I have the same testimony. When we face the forces of hell, we can literally point our finger at the devil and his cohorts and say, listen, what you've intended for my destruction, God has caused me to be promoted and to be blessed. Amen. I'm deeper and richer and by far much better than I would have been if I hadn't gone through what I went through. We all know if we get honest, if we've walked with the Lord at any length of time in our life, the times we were closest to God have been the times where the fire was the hottest. And the crisis was the greatest. So many times we, re we reject that. I love what Paul said. He said, you know, we are living epistles. We're living letters to be read of all men. And you know, there's some chapters in there that are not the best, all right? We might have been our worst, but we saw the grace of God. And there's some chapters there we went through the most difficult of times. We might have stumbled all the way through it, but we discovered the grace of God. There's times of just absolute failure even. The Apostle James said we all stumble in many ways. We found the grace of God. And we can say in the result of it, glory to God. But we can also be read by other people who see us walk through what we walk through. And they see us endure in the grace and the peace and the power and the victory that the Lord has for us. Kathy and I, in this context of some of this little bit I shared with you, we were able to see some great miracles. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate your prayers, and we appreciate your prayers for that, in the context of the mission trips we took. And some of you made great sacrifices, and you, you, you did what the Lord wanted you to do, and you participated in the Lord wanted you, and lives will be forever changed. And some of it was with difficulty, and some of it was with great sacrifices on some of your part. You went, and you did anyway. 
Not only were you blessed, not only did you see the power of God in your life, but you saw God touch a lot of other people's lives as well to your surrendered heart. And some of you probably felt absolutely, and you got out on the mission field like, I, what am I doing here? <laughs> I've felt that way most of my life. <laughs> what am I doing here? We are where we are by the grace of God, and we need to shine where we are by the grace of God, and we need to blossom and bear fruit where we are by the grace of God. Trouble comes. I'm going to close with this last few verses of Psalms 20. He goes down and he gets into verse, go ahead and open because I don't, I don't put it on the screen. I just, this is where we're going to finish the sermon. Verse 4, he says, May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill you all your counsel. Verse 5 says, We will sing for joy over your victory, and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. And may the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Verse 6, Now know that the Lord saves as anointed. That's anyone who's a child of God is his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven and with saving grace of his right hand. Verse 7. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down, they have fallen, but we have risen and we have stood upright. Save, O Lord, may the king answer us in the day we call. Which is pretty much verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. But verse, the last verse says, may the Lord May the king answer you in the day you call. So in other words, the day of trouble should be the day of calling. Don't ever hesitate. Don't ever listen to Satan when he says, oh, you're just praying because you need God right now. Well, duh. <laughs> Agree with your adversary while you're in the way with him, Scripture says. Say, that's right, devil, so get out of the way. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'm continuing to call the name of the Lord. I don't know how that message has ministered to you today or what it said to you today, but I do believe with all my heart because of the world and the times that we are in right now, the years are troubling days, that God had a word for you somewhere in the context of that message. Amen. And I'm trusting that you'll receive that word and hear that word and embrace the grace of God who loves you more than you can ever comprehend. Amen. You say, well, Brother Joe, you know what? It doesn't matter. God's bigger than that. You don't know what kind of problem I'm in. It doesn't matter. God's bigger than that. You don't know what kind of difficulty I'm facing. God's bigger than that. But Brother Joe, it's like a mountain. God made the mountain. Psalmist went on later to say, He has made my feet like hind's feet. All right? Hind was a deer, like a small kind of cross between a goat and deer, real small. And their feet are engineered in creation for climbing. David says, You know, He has made my feet like hind's what's, what's that mean? That means he has equipped you for whatever mountain you're on. He's equipped you for whatever trouble you're facing. He has given you what you need. You need to call on Him, and you'll experience it in your life. Would you stand with your heads bowed? We'll finish this message, hopefully.